Okay. We're learning Likutei Sichos for Parshas Kedoshim, Volume 1. And the second Sicha is also separation. It's also about... But this time it's about Mamish separation, the way that people usually understand separation, and the way that usually people understand sanctity, not the way that we explained it in the, the pre, not the way that the Rebbe explained it in the previous uh, section. Page 243, chapter 6. דובר רע לאיל שינננ שקדושה ועבדלה או שגם בדברים הנירים מבחינה חיצונית דומים לשל אומות העולם צריכה להיות קדושה. Previous section, the speak Chiddush, that Kedusha, holiness and separation, means being different in those things that we are universally the same with other people, meaning that we also engage in universally. How you dress, how you eat, how you drink, and so on. This is the continuation of the, it's, it's at the very end of this week's Parsha, but it's the continuation of this commandment to be holy. And it says that you should be holy. And it's interesting that only now he, he adds this, that this is something that the sages said, that you should sanctify yourself in those things that are permissible, not in things that you're obligated. And that, that's a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, source for the fact that separation, the true sanctity, doesn't come from Torah and mitzvot. It comes from your day-to-day banal engagements with the world. And how you do those things. And that's called Bechol Drachechadeu. In all your ways you should know him. Tzivui ze, Kadesh Atzmecha Bamutar Lecha, Eino Kfi Sheishnam Svurim, Inyan Shel Idur Mitzvah Vachadome. So some people think that to sanctify yourself in these things, in the permissible things, in the things that the Torah does not govern, or as a word, doesn't tell you what to do, that those people think that this is a embellishment of, of the mitzvah. It's not, it's not something that's really required. But the truth is, that that's not true. It, this is an actual mitzvah from the Torah. And says about different mitzvahs of the Torah, even if this seems like a light mitzvah to you, something that's not so important, they should all seem equal to you. And you shouldn't weigh their severity or their uh, uh, importance and so on. So this mitzvah, that you should sanctify yourself in those universal permissible things, has the same weight and the same... Um, uh, um, what did you say? Importance. Importance as all the other mitzvahs from the Torah. Yeter al but it's not just that. That's from the halachic point of view, he says. But from the Hasidic point of view, there's something new here. That this explains so many things. Um, this is such an important principle, what he's about to say now. That the geula, the redemption, the coming of Mashiach, the Tchiyaz Amesim. This is all dependent on the work that we do during this time. But specifically in Chassidus it's explained that this is, depends, that the redemption, that the coming of the Mashiach and everything that goes together with that depends on sanctifying ourselves in those things that are permissible, not the things that the Torah obligated us to. Meaning it, exactly the things, and we're going to talk about this, and see an example in a moment. He doesn't really bring uh, examples, but we'll see in a moment. The way that we do Pesach, the way that we do Pesach with all these extra stringencies, people look at it and say, this turns people off. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. Why, why do we not want to do this? It's enough what the Torah told us to do. It's not true. Why is it not true? Because we'll see in a moment the, the logic behind The logic behind it, I think, is foolproof. It really makes a lot of sense. And the Rebbe sort of in the beginning tells you this is not volunteer work. You can't volunteer to do this or not. This is a mitzvah from the Torah. You have to do this. 
one could say that every person should decide how much of these stringencies he can take upon himself. Why? Because it, when it says, it doesn't say exactly how much you need to do. How many of the things that you engage in every day? Should, 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 your, should, should the um, buttons on your, on, your, on your shirt also be different? It doesn't go to that level. It doesn't say, um, you know, when you walk into a Jewish house, everybody has a house. Everybody lives somewhere. There's two types of, really, there's, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of them, but in principle, there's two types of, Jew, of Jewish houses. There are the houses that look like everybody else's houses. It's an Ikea house. It looks the same as everyone else's. But then there are some houses that you walk into, and you say, this place is Jewish. Why? Because instead of art on the walls, they have bookshelves. Instead of having everything is, uh, is around the TV, so everything is around the, 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 the main table where people sit and learn. You, you right away you, you notice that the, this house is organized differently. And a lot of times, there's no special uh, adornments, there's no special ornaments. It's, not, it's very simple, it's very plain. In the same way that I guess if somebody would walk into an Amish house, they could tell right away. Because these people, they don't have, uh, some of them don't have electricity. They don't, it looks different. It just looks like from, it's from 100 years ago. So a Jewish house doesn't necessarily look like, it's from, like, look like it's from 100 years ago. But it will look like this is a house that's centered around something else. It, 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 the whole atmosphere is completely different. The moment that you don't have a TV, the moment you, you don't have a computer a screen somewhere in you know, a central place, everything changes. And the whole energy of the house is different. And so those are things that almost everybody who feels that they want to be different, that they want to lead a different type of life, they don't want to, I'll say, enslave themselves to the media, to, to, to everything around that. So they have a different type of lifestyle. And you see that. So, so, so there's nothing that tells you exactly how much you need to do. The Torah, there's nowhere in the halacha that tells you like this or like that. Still, if you go to Williamsburg, and you go into, a, into a, any house in, a, in, in Williamsburg, maybe almost any house in Crown Heights, certainly many of the houses in Borough Park, and you go into many of the houses in Geula, and you, you'll see this, this particular style which speaks that this is Jewish, it's different. Again, but there are Jews who are completely from, 100% from, and their house looks exactly like any other IKEA house in the world. There's no difference. You can't tell the difference. And they have a, a big screen in the middle, and, and still they're from. And some people will say, this is the level of sanctity that I'm comfortable with. And there are other people who say, this is the level of sanctity I'm comfortable with. It's okay. I, I, you can't tell a person you haven't done enough, because that's not how this mitzvah works. Because really, in the end, it's drachecha. It's your ways. So, so the Rebbe tried to create a certain atmosphere of, of difference. Uh, that's exactly what, that's what, exactly what we talked about last, uh, last time we, we met, about the mother and the father passing this on, creating this in the children. So it could be the mother and father getting it from the Rebbe, it doesn't matter. But the point is, every person uh, uh, determines what is comfortable for them in terms of engaging in this mitzvah. You can't not engage in it at all. Like you said, this is a mitzvah from the Torah to sanctify your universal, banal life, the part that the Torah seemingly doesn't touch upon. But I can't tell you how much you, you need to do. Still, know that this is what the redemption depends on. The redemption doesn't depend on your putting tefillin in on. It's amazing. It doesn't, and he'll prove it in a second. He has a great argument why, why this is not, it's not to say that you shouldn't put tefillin on, that's also missing from the Torah. <laughs> But this, but the, but the, but, but the effect of the of the tefillin is not for the redemption. It's a different effect. Okay. Limda Torah, kiyum mitzvot veimanut min advarim asurim enam aspikim kedei lamshich ta gula atida v'darush gam kadesh atzmecha b'mutar lecha. So the Torah of Chassidus says that it's not enough. The regular uh, um, prohibitions that we have in Torah that we knew that, that we don't take upon ourselves personally 
they are not enough in order to bring the Geula. They're not enough in order to bring the, the redemption. And I'll say, show why in a second. It's in the next chapter. But first is a little bit. The tzaddikim, the righteous people, will be called holy. People will say these people are holy. They'll see that they're different. In the same way that God is called holy. And we talked about the last time because, like Rav Nachum of Chernobyl says, Yachol kamoni benichuta. Can it be like me? Can your sanctity be like me? Yes, it can be like me, says Rav Nachum of Chernobyl. But what does it mean that it's like me? That you're both in the world and out of the world at the same time. Meaning you have a house like everybody else, and yet this house is out of the world. It's not like the regular houses that you see on TV. This is a different house altogether. In the same way, Hashem is in the world and outside of the world at the same time. That's what he means by the sanctity can be the same. I think that's what he means. That this is a table, it's like any other table, but because we're learning on it now, it's elevated to a different state. It's still the same table, it didn't change. It's not like its molecular structure it changes, it's all the same. But because we're using it to learn Torah on, it's now in a different state. So it's a regular table, but it's different. Yeah, that, that's how Hashem is in the world and out of the world at the same time. That he's everything that's in the world, but he's also out of the world. The out of the world part is what is revealed in a certain sense when you do a mitzvah with that object. Like we said, everything that will be revealed in the future. And Geula is a, is a revelation. See, a lot of people call it a redemption. But really, a geula is a revelation. What is a rev- It's a revelation of godliness at a level that we have never encountered before in reality. And that all of reality was, will, will reveal God in a way that it doesn't reveal it now. So all that depends on our actions, as he said, says in the Tanya, our actions now. And so, one of these revelations is that people will look at a tzaddik, they'll look at a, at a righteous person, and they'll say he's holy. How will that happen? Here we see that it's exactly the same. You, you're called holy because of a holiness. And the holiness is something that can be seen. Why is it something that can be seen? Because it's not other real. It's not something that is ephemeral. It's a difference between you and other people. A difference that can be seen in the eye. Yesterday I was teaching this somewhere else. And one of the examples that came to my mind in terms of eating is that we don't eat in the dark. It's forbidden to eat in the dark. Ah, forbidden? Forbidden like, eat, like eating on Yom Kippur? No, it's not the same level of forbidden. It's not halacha. You can't say exactly it's halacha. It's a, it's a good way to, to act. But it's in the Shulchan Aruch. You should eat only when, the, when you can see the food. Why, why is that? The answer is because if you don't see the food that you're eating, the food's eating you, you're not eating the food. Meaning, in other words, you have to be on top. We've talked about this in terms of when we were talking in Shlach Lecha many years ago, learning about the uh, spies that Moshe Rabbeinu sent to see the land of Israel. One of the explanations of the Chassidus is because to conquer the land, you have to be someone who sees it before you come to conquer it. You can't just conquer something in the dark and not know what it is. Because you're not conquering it. It's actually conquering you. You're subjugating yourself to it. A lot of people today eat in the dark all the time. It doesn't matter whether it's dark or light, whether they're in a fully lit room. They're eating in the dark because they don't look at what they eat. They don't understand what they're eating. They, they, they just shove it in. And they don't really chew it either. And they're, not, they're not mindful of what they're eating. But that's, that's a halacha that's like this, that you sanctify yourself with what you eat. Meaning you have intent that I want to be nourished from this. That's called eating in light. It's not exactly just dependent on how much light there is and, uh, you know, from the, the wattage of the light bulb. Never seen anybody discuss that. It depends on your consciousness. And mo- most of what's happening, is, and that's why people are suffering from the food. One of the big reasons is because they're not mindful of what they eat. I mean, you can eat a lot, eat a little. I'm not talking about the, the quantities. I'm talking about what is your approach to the food itself. You have to be on top of it in the sense that I'm taking from this. I have to see what I'm taking from. In any case, 
So that is what leads to sanctity. And everybody can see this, that you eat mindfully. First of all, because it takes longer. <laughs> um, but more than that, it's, it's holy. You see that a person has, I would say in a certain sense, respect for what they eat. And otherwise, if you don't have respect for it, it doesn't have respect for you. And it does whatever it does inside you. Okay, now chapter 8 is the explanation. Why is it this way? Why is the redemption, the revelation of godliness in the future, dependent on our sanctifying ourselves in all these stringencies that the Torah never told us to? The explanation for this is, The higher the light, meaning the higher the revelation of godliness, the more delicate it is, really. What is the revelation of more, more, more godliness? People think that if this table is going to reveal godliness, it's going to shout it out. Like it says in the prophet, that even mikir tizak, that the stone is going to sh- shout out from the, uh, from the um, wall. And then the image that it conjures up is that somehow this is going to be a very, very violently <coughs> a vocal <coughs> reali- <coughs> sorry, reality that we're going to live in. Like we're going to live in a place where everything is shouting. It's exactly the opposite. When the prophet says it's going to shout out, he means that it's going to be heard not because it's volumes of, of sound, not because it's more decibels. It's going to be heard because you won't be able to run away from it. But it's a very delicate sound. It's not a sound, you know, you hear the, the, the great shofar that's going to blast when the gula comes. People think the whole world is going to shake. The world's not going to shake because the sound is going to be too, it's, it's going to be a, you know, a heavy metal concert. That's not it. It'll be the slightest, slightest sound. But you won't be able to run away from it. It'll penetrate you. It's a very delicate thing. And the truth is, if you just put on headphones, you won't hear it. You will hear it through the headphones. But in terms of sound, anything can win against it. The same thing is with seeing godliness in the future. The godliness that's going to be seen is not that this, the color of this table or the color of my hat is suddenly going to become fluorescent. And wow, it's going to shout out everywhere. It's, it's, it's exactly the opposite. It's going to be the most subtle change. And you can ignore it if you want to. Well, it would be hard to ignore it, but because it's, going to, it's going to penetrate you at least for a while. But eventually you can ignore it again. You, you, you can. And he says, because this change is so slight, anything can cover it up. Really, if you choose not to take part in this, it will be covered up with the smallest thing. To say it another way, it's not about choice. I sort of misspoke here. It's not that you'll choose to. But anything that you do that is contrary to that revelation will continue to conceal it. Anything at all. It's very simple to conceal it. Dugmata amur legabea katuv usvivav nisara meod. The holier you are, it's not that the more colors you see, it's the more subtle you become. And so God is stringent. He himself expects from those who fear him a higher level of delicate, uh, of, of, of paying attention to details. And so if you're into the, the slightest change, will make it so that you can't see the difference between two things that you did. Meaning, if, if you're making very delicate ornaments, so the slightest you know, change of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, one of the muscles will make the ornament not equal on all sides. Maybe you're the only one that will see it. But so that in the end, if you make any kind of uh, a transgression, it immediately covers up that revelation of Hashem. Because again, the point is that this is not going to overwhelm you in the sense of being something violent taking over. It's the opposite. It's that you're going to become more refined to notice things that are more subtle in reality. And that's the way this revelation is going to come about. The greater a tzaddik is, 
the more he pays attention to the details. We see the same thing regarding the circumcision. Three, four thousand, almost no, three thousand five hundred years ago, three thousand seven hundred, almost eight hundred years ago, when Avram Avinu was to receive a revelation of Hashem, and that's why Hashem, why God gave him the circumcision to reveal godliness through his body, even. So, what did he need to receive? He only needed to remove the thick foreskin. And thick means that it's completely opaque. And it's very thick. It's, it's, it's skin, like, like skin is. And then God told him, you can walk before me and be whole. So that was 3,800 years ago. But, 800 years later, uh, sorry, 400 years later, when it was time for the Jews to receive the Torah, and that is a greater revelation than what Avram had, much greater. This was a higher name, because by the Avos, what was revealed to them was the name Shin Dalid Yud, Shakai. But the name Yud Kevavke, even though they knew about it, was not revealed to them. God did not reveal Himself in that way. Kakatuv, as it says, I revealed to myself to them Bekel Shakai, and this name Kel Shakai. Ushmi Avaya lo and my, my name Avaya, I didn't reveal myself to them with. It wasn't enough to just remove the foreskin. What did they have to do? They also needed to remove the thin part of the skin that's left over after you remove the foreskin. So the way I understand that this works is that it's really one piece of skin. The whole foreskin that's removed in circumcision is, the same, is just one piece of skin. But skin when you remove it, leaves a film behind. There's a thin part of the skin that remains connected to the flesh. It doesn't come off. And this will be true anywhere in the body that you do it. Why is it? Because the dermis is many, many uh, layers. So this thin layer at the very bottom, that's the one that's closest to the flesh itself, is transparent and it's left on the flesh. And I guess it's the, the, the body does this because of uh, preventing infection to some to some extent, it's still some kind of some kind of protection, and that's where the rest of the skin is it makes it easier for the rest of the skin to grow from, to to regrow itself. But that's not what we do here. And we we really remove it. So when they received the Torah, they had to add something more. The removal of that thin film, which again is just a part of the same skin, but it's the skin part that's left over. It's very hard to see it even. And that's called priya. Asarata orla hadaka. Removal of the thin film that is also a foreskin. And where do we learn this from? The Gemara learns this from the wording of the circumcision that was done before they went into the land of Israel. Because they only circumcised twice in the 40 years from when they came out of Egypt till when they came into the land of Israel. Why only twice? Because of different reasons. But the first time was still in Egypt. And then, just before they came into the land of Israel, the one that was in Egypt, Moshe Rabbein oversaw. And the one that was before they came into the land of Israel, Yoshua oversaw. And it says, Shuv Mor. So it says, do it the same way that Moshe Rabbeinu did it. Meaning that it's not the way that Abraham did it. That's the way the Gemara learns it. And not exactly, but I'm making it simpler. <laughs> okay, so, so the Priya, which we need to speak a little bit more about, this was, renew, this was renewed in 400 years later. Why? Because it needed a greater revelation. So the greater the revelation, the more delicate the need to take care of what you are removing. Okay? That you have to be more delicate, you have to be more exact. Okay, and we'll continue, God willing, tomorrow. Is it?